arterial valvular stenosis. And we're going to start with pulmonary valvular stenosis. I'm going to show you how we can understand valvular stenosis on the basis of the normal anatomy we discussed almost three days ago now. And then we'll move on to the aortic valve and we'll note the differences from the aortic valve, but again we'll use the same concept to describe the pathology of the valvular stenosis. So let me build up again for you the structure of the pulmonary valve because hopefully you will remember that there is a circular junction between the completely muscular infundibulum and the fibrous arterial valvular sinuses. And you will also remember, I hope, that the distal extent of the valve is the sinutubular junction. And then when we put in the valvar leaflets, which have their distal attachment at this sinutubular junction, they cross that previous anatomic ventricular arterial junction. And I explained to you how this crossing and the semilunar attachment of the leaflets produced <coughs> fibrous tissue as triangles which extend the outflow tract and muscle in the pulmonary valve at the base of each of the pulmonary valvar sinuses. And then you will also recall that the so-called annulus that you measure as echocardiographers is no more than a virtual ring which is constructed by joining together the movements of the valvar sinuses. Now if we look at valvar stenosis, there are various forms of that produce the stenotic arrangement. One is so-called commissural fusion. The other is overall dysplasia of the valvar leaflets. And the third, which is closely linked to so-called commissural fusion, is tethering at the sinutubular junction. And you can easily imagine that if we have three zones of apposition between the leaflets, as you see here, then if those leaflets fuse at the peripheral attachments which are called the commissures, the greater the degree of commissural fusion, the more severe will be the valvar stenosis. And that is exactly what you see in dome stenosis of the pulmonary valve. So here you're looking down on a critically stenosed pulmonary valve, and there you see the peripheral attachments at the sinutubular junction, and you see how the leaflets are now tethered at those attachments, and you see how the commissural fusion, the fusion between the leaflets at their zones of apposition, has progressed towards the centroid of the valvar orifice. And obviously, the greater the degree of such fusion along these zones of apposition, the more severe will be the valvar stenosis. And it is then paradoxical that the more stenotic the valve becomes, the further away from the sinutubular junction moves the attachment of the valvar leaflets. It approaches the ventricular arterial junction, and only when the valve is severely stenotic do we truly see an annular movement of those valvar leaflets. And we can then extend that concept to the aortic outflow tract, remembering that when we look at the aortic outflow tract, only two of the leaflets are supported by muscle. They still have their distal attachments at the sinutubular junction, but it is only those sinuses that face the pulmonary trunk that have muscle at the base of the sinus in the non-coronary sinus of the aortic root there is fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the aortic valve and the leaflet of the mitral valve. And we believe that this difference in the attachments of the leaflets conditions the form of aortic stenosis as opposed to stenosis. So when we look at critical aortic stenosis, the situation we see is described as unicuspid and unicommissural, but again, it is due to the loss of those semilunar hinges. And once more, paradoxically, we truly have an annular attachment of the leaflets. And typically, there is also associated hypoplasia of the aortic root and the ascending aorta. And in the most severe cases, there is additional endocardial fibrous elastosis 
which unequivocally puts these examples into the ballpark of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. But this is the arrangement which we see in the critically stenotic aortic valve. And as you see, it is markedly different from the arrangement that we see in the pulmonary valve because the orifice of the valve, the persisting orifice of the valve, is eccentrically located. And it appears as a keyhole, and always in our experience the keyhole faces backwards towards the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve. And that is the only part of the valve our curve that retains its attachment at the sinutubular junction. So if we compare the normal arrangement of the valve where each of the sinuses extends up to the sinutubular junction, when we have the critically stenotic aortic valve, then at the site of two of the interleafly triangles, we have a, a fold in the wall of the aorta and an annular attachment of the leaflets, so that the solitary normal triangle forms the persisting orifice within the stenotic valve. And we see a similar situation when the valve is bicuspid. Here is a lovely example where there is a raffe between the two coronary arterial leaflets, and you note that there has been reduction of the interleaflet triangle, again with an annular attachment of the two arterial leaflets. Now we have two persisting triangles extending up the sinutubular junction. So here we have what I like to identify as the annular paradox. We all describe arterial valves as having annuluses, but what we've shown you is that the normal aortic valve totally lacks any annular attachment, and that the more obvious becomes the annular attachment, the worse is the degree of valvar stenosis. The other consequence of an annular attachment of rudimentary leaflets is the so-called absent pulmonary valve syndrome. So this reinforces my belief that we should be describing the arterial valves without recourse to a non-existent valvar annulus.